Hey, everybody. That's, a, that's my favorite thing. Everyone pops their head up. <laughs> I see some faces from the other class. <laughs> you guys are going to be sick of me by the end of the day. <laughs> um, now I have to talk over, I, I know we can hear the theater a little bit, so I'll, I'll try and talk over Stev. Uh, my colleague Stev is a very um, energetic Frenchman that speaks very loudly, so I'm going to try and speak over him. <laughs> can you guys hear me okay? You guys have the monitors right in front, so that's nice. Um, so my name's Matt DiNapoli, for those who don't know me. Uh, I work for DevNet. I'm a systems engineer, I guess you could say. I do a bunch of other stuff. Um, I had uh, done Coding 101, but actually I realize now that that's the last time we're doing it for this session, so if you missed it, too bad. Um, I'm going to be talking about the CMX API uh, today. I know it has this long you know, title to it talking about the blue dot connected service and all that stuff. What we're going to talk about is location services, very plain and simply. And we're going to talk about the APIs that enable um, the ability to build those applications. And then we'll show some uh, demonstration information for uh, that particular content. Now, um, depending on how comfortable you are with CMX, um, just so you know, and this is a little confusing, so I'm going to put the, the caveat out there. Um, we're going to be talking about enterprise CMX, so um, Cisco's, I guess you can say, classic wireless infrastructure. So that's the wireless LAN controllers, the access points that if you look up to the back there, you can see them, the ones with the blue dots on them. Um, that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, Meraki is also a, a wireless infrastructure that we offer. Um, they also have CMX. I'm not talking about that. I realized um, probably a little too late that it would be good to have a discussion about the differences between the two CMXs. Um, didn't get that done in time. So um, come back next year and, and check that one out. So anyways, we're going to be only talking about the enterprise um, CMX. Uh, so if you were here for Meraki, I mean, you could stay, please. But if you're particularly interested in that, we are not talking about that. OK, cool. Do, I already did that introduction. Um, we're going to talk about the CMX solution. So CMX stands for Connected Mobile Experience. It is Cisco's, um, it's, it's the whole thing. So you'll, you'll hear the term used interchangeably with um, MSE, which is the Mobility Services Engine. And I'll tell you about how that fits into the infrastructure. Um, but CMX is really just the overarching marketing term. Um, so that, that can also be confusing as well. Um, and what CMX is comprised of are two pillars, or three pillars, excuse me, detect, uh, detect um, connect, and engage. Detect, in my opinion, is the most important portion. Uh, you can't do the other two without detecting, obviously. Um, detecting is being able to identify your laptops, your mobile devices in a space. Um, and so that's the detect portion of, of this. Uh, and, and that's the thing we're going to look at when we look at the APIs. Um, Connect allows you to manage guest access, Wi-Fi to a particular area, um, things like that. And then engage is to be able to reach out to um, the people that are on your network in some form or fashion. So those are the three different pillars of uh, the connected mobile experience. All right, But just for all intents and purposes, CMX itself, it's not a technology. It's a marketing term. OK? This is, in my opinion, the interesting stuff, how the connected mobile experience works. So we have our devices. Again, our mobile phones, might be 802.11 tags, might be laptops. Um, they're interacting with access points. Now, those access points are being managed by a wireless LAN controller, and then they talk to what's called the, the Mobility Services Engine. The Mobility S Services Engine, or MSE, is um, the heart of the CMX solution. It's the heart of the service. This is the device, or it's actually a virtual machine now, for the most part, um, that does all of the heavy lifting. It does the math to figure out where your device is located in this space. So. <coughs> The access points are collecting a bunch of information about your device um, using signal strength and sending that information through the wireless link controllers to the MSE. Now, the MSE is taking and aggregating that information from three, four, five access points that can see your device um, and saying, all right, I think that this person, or I should say this device is in this location uh, based on the information that's been given to me. And it does that by uh, triangulation. It'll draw circles of confidence based on um, the signal strength that those access points are reporting. And it'll pinpoint 
where it thinks the device is. Now, um, I'm going to go through in a second and tell you the different ways you can make accuracy better. Um, but for, for right now, we're just going to talk about how the infrastructure is set up. That information then is available to us. Once the MSC does that math, and it does it very quickly, um, it, uh, that, that data is available. And so uh, we're going to see ways to access that data through the APIs. Um, but CMX also has an analytics UI built into it as well. Um, so you can also leverage the pre-built one if you'd like. It's all managed by prime infrastructure. But the thing of particular interest to DevNet are the northbound clients. Um, the MSC has a northbound API. Um, all that means is it's a REST API that you can consume uh, through standard REST calls. And if you were in 101 before, now you know what a REST call is. So um, this should be pretty uh, old territory for you. Um, but these are the applications that third-party developers are going to be working on. These are the applications that customers are going to be working on. These are the applications that partners are going to be working on. Um, and so being able to um, build those applications allows, or being able to use those APIs allows us to build those applications that then become useful to, um, to your customers, or our customers' customers. So that's pretty, pretty straightforward. Any questions on how the infrastructure is laid out for the CMX solution? No? How would it scale? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so I don't remember the exact numbers, um, but I know that depending on the version of Mobility Services Engine that you um, manage, um, you can have somewhere between 2,500 and 25,000 clients that are managed. Um, you can you st you stack them. You'd have one versus another. So it does scale, but across VMs. The question was, how does that, that process scale? So um, there might be some instances where you are providing location services for um, you know, a small office space, and you don't have to worry about it too much. Obviously, you'd have the lower end MSC. For an environment like this, um, you know, uh, you're going to want to, and I'll talk about um, access point density and things like that in a little bit. Um, you're going to want to have maybe a couple MSCs running that are doing that work. So there are a bunch of different options for uh, location. So I mentioned earlier that they do triangulation. And to do triangulation, you need to have less three access points providing information. In this instance, we have, um, in instances where we don't have three access points, all we can provide for is presence. That's basically the access point sees you. Um, you're not necessarily going to build a map out for that um, because it would be useless to do that. Uh, so if you just want notifications that um, people are in your space, then that would be the presence portion of this. Um, and all you need for that is a Cisco AP and potentially an, an, an MSC. Now, you want to get into basic location, uh, potentially wayfinding, correlation to space. Um, maybe you're just building out heat maps. Nothing that requires um, pinpoint location. Um, what you're going to do is basic location. That'll provide you some XY coordinates. The confidence factor in that is a little bit smaller. Or it's, big, it's obviously bigger than presence, but it's one of the smaller areas. Um, the location service offering is uh, advertised as 7 meters within 95% confidence. Um, that's still a big distance. 7 meters is going to get us to the end of this classroom. So um, maybe it'll be able to tell that you're here, um, but it might also say that you're in the other classroom. So it uh, just depends on how granular that information is. Now, as we go down this line, um, each step requires a little more configuration and a little more work um, to get it to a point where you, uh, where you are getting that kind of a, a coverage. Now, <clears throat> once we get to enhanced location, that is um, basically adding access points. And so in a space like this, um, you know, we, so for this room in particular, we could get really good location if we had four access points in this, this area. But access points cost money, and so you have to figure out um, you know, how much is it worth to be able to get that enhanced location. Um, you're going to set up, uh, your, you know, you're going to make sure your map is um, measured out properly. So if we're mapping this room, I need to know exactly how, f how wide and how long it is. And then we're talking about, now we get into talking about 
um, putting in the Z coordinate for the access point or how high it is from the floor. And so those kinds of things come into the enhanced location. And then finally, the, the coup de gras is um, hyperlocation. Hyperlocation is the ability to almost pinpoint to within one meter um, accuracy 95% of the time the location of a device. This actually takes a lot of work. Um, the, the, we, so we've offered this for years, that five meter accuracy, and people would come to me and they'd say, well, why isn't it better? And I'm like, because that last part is hard. Like That is really challenging to get that location right because you only have so much data to aggregate. Well, I guess a few smart people figured out that if we add Bluetooth antennas to the access points, we can get a lot more data back that we can aggregate into it. So um, I don't, these access points don't have them. Um, so I guess they don't really care too much about location services here. But uh, there's a, what's called a halo module. And it's a, it's a, it is a ring that the access point sits in. And within it, there are um, a bunch of Bluetooth antenna. I think there are four or five or so. And that information is fed through the, um, on top of the Wi-Fi antenna information, it's fed through the, M or through the wireless LAN controller to the MSE. All the software was updated for the mobility services engine to take that information into account. And um, now given the, f the fact that you've uh, done the correct configuration and calibration, I'll talk about that in a second, we can offer uh, one meter accuracy 95% of the time with hyperlocation. Now, it requires that module, it requires certain access points, it requires you know, all of the infrastructure in place, but <laughs> the, the annoying thing, or I guess it's required, um, is that it requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of configuration, it requires a lot of calibration. So when I was talking about being able to make sure that we have our map laid out properly and the, 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 Z, um, the Z value set for our access points, in this instance, the tolerance is only about an inch. So if we're setting up access points 30 feet in the air, or excuse me, 10 meters in the air, um, you know, we want to make sure we're within a couple centimeters of tolerance. And access points, you know, they're like this thick. So we're talking about the thickness of an access point. Um, you can't be off. And that'll affect our location uh, because it's doing a calculation based on signal strength, you know, how far the radio waves are moving away from our particular device. And so we, it needs to know that you know, that angle of attack for that particular device is, is correct. And so it requires that. And then it requires walking around the space and watching yourself move and say, yes, I'm here, or no, I'm not here, or yes, this point is valid. So it takes a lot of work to get to that hyperlocation. These first three are kind of easy. That last one is very, is not very hard, but it's a lot harder. And it took a few years to get to the point where we could even offer this as a service. So, but now we're to that point, which is cool. And, um, you know, with hyperlocation, you could do things like um, legitimate inventory tracking, asset tracking. Uh, one example that I like to talk about, so um, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I don't know if you guys know where that is. It's in the middle of the United States. And we have, um, I would say it's a, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a world-renowned hospital as far as we're concerned called the Cleveland Clinic. And they've been a Cisco customer for a long time, and I used to support the location services API. And I found out that they had built an application, their in-house team had built an application using the mobility services engine. Um, that was tracking infusion pumps. And I don't really know what an infusion pump does. It doesn't really matter for this story. What you need to know is they're expensive, and they had to buy a lot of them because people didn't know where they were. The nurses would go use them, and then they'd leave them in the room, or someone would take one out and leave it somewhere else that it wasn't supposed to be. And they were finding that they were buying these infusion pumps every year and spending money on them because... People couldn't find them. We don't have enough infusion pumps. We don't have enough infusion pumps. So, excuse me. Um, what they decided to do was track them. It seems like we're always buying these infusion pumps. It's hard to walk out the door with them. We don't think they're getting stolen. Where the hell are they? <laughs> so, um, they slapped some 802.11 tags on them, built out this CMX application for it specifically, and they realized that at any given point in time, about 40 to 50% of the infusion pumps were being used, which means that they did, had no need to buy these every year. And so it ended up saving them a few million dollars a year because they had this asset tracking 
now tied to their devices, and they were able to get more use out of them because they were tracking them. So that's a little uh, anecdote I like to talk about. And I actually saw the application work, and I saw them move around the space. Now, sometimes they'd be like, well, it says it's over here because we didn't have hyperlocation yet, and then it would just be over there. But at least got them in the right spot, right? So any questions on how the location works and all of that fun stuff? What's that? Um, so the first three, um, I believe it's any access point. For hyperlocation, the last I checked, and uh, forgive me for this because I, I don't really work for the product team. <laughs> um, it was the 3700 series and then the, the Halo module that, that for, for that. But um, location services, as far as I know, 3700s, uh, 1100s, 1200s, they're all in that series all support that, yeah. Because um, they're all collecting the same data. They're working off of that. Yeah. That, it, there are Bluetooth antennas, yeah. What's that? I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Is there a, is there a mic? Yeah, uh, well, um, I, believe, I believe you do for the, I, I hear you. The question is, uh, do you need both? Is the question, do you need both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi service on the device? Um, I believe so, yes, to get that hyperlocation. Um, I don't know for sure, though, so I don't, I, I think, so I can check. This guy might know. I'm sorry? There, in, yeah, there is. Yeah, there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's what's in the, the module. The, the, now, the AP itself may or may not, but the, the Halo does. Yeah. <laughs> now, I don't know if you can leverage those Bluetooth mod. Um, uh, you know, uh, people have started leveraging Bluetooth um, content management services. I don't know if you can access those Bluetooth antenna to like ping out data um, like you can with the Meraki ones. Um, so it, it may be possible. I, I don't know for sure if that's the case. But I do know that there are Bluetooth antenna in there. Cool. Good discussion. All right. All right. So we talked about how it's all laid out. But really what we're concerned with in the DevNet zone are APIs. So. I'm going to actually walk you guys through what CMX looks like. We're not going to do this anymore. Can you guys see? So right now I'm logged into CMX. And actually, you guys can access this too if you want. Um, the address is msc.sandbox.cisco.com, colon 8081. Can you guys see that OK? Is that big enough? I know the URL is small. And what we're looking at right now <coughs> is, a, is a demo. Um, it's, a, it's our sandbox environment for the MSC. And if you're not familiar with the, the DevNet sandbox, uh, we have a lot of um, different technologies set up for you to access as developers in a kind of stable test environment. So you don't have to go out buy all our equipment, set up your own labs. We become your lab, um, at least for um, you know, s starting to get build out applications. Now, um, you could leverage the MSC Sandbox to build a whole CMX application. And um, I actually have confidence that that application would then work in a real environment. Because the data that's being generated by this Sandbox is exactly the same format, exactly the same content as the data that would be generated in a real environment. because. All we're doing here is, for this particular sandbox, we have a controller image that is faking out APs and clients and pushing that through to a controller image that doesn't know that it's getting fake data, and then pushing that to the MSC. So as far as the mobility services engine is concerned, those are real access points. Those are real clients. Now, it's not smart enough to know that when every single person moves five meters in every 10 seconds, that that's probably weird. <laughs> so that's why you see people jumping around instead of like hanging out in one area and then moving somewhere else. Um, it's because it's, you know, that's how it's generating its data. Um, 
So, but this is a, a map of a space. Uh, we have a few access points here. We can actually hover over um, the access points and see which devices are associated with it. So we know that this access point up here is able to see all of these devices. Um, and you can do that to manage kind of um, the density I was talking about, the coverage. Um, and so we're actually looking at a floor. When you're setting up CMX, it requires um, that you have a definition of a campus, so a set of buildings. It could be just one building, but you have to have that campus set up. Um, the building, which is then comprised of a bunch of floors. In this instance, we just have one floor set up. And then at the floor level is where you set up your map, and you put in your measurements and your ceiling height and all of that stuff that goes into it. So all of the configuration happens here. Um, what we can also do, and I will show you guys that, is you can draw zones. So we have the floor, but maybe it'd be useful, say it's a retail solution, and you want to know how many people are hanging out in the grocery section versus the sporting goods section, if this store in general has sporting goods and groceries in it, <laughs> which in the United States we have a number of those. Uh, I don't know as much in Europe. But um, you might want to draw zones out and determine when people are entering or leaving those zones. Now these are obviously just virtual zones, and we're just drawing them on the map. Um, but you know, given the fact that the map is set up properly and everything is in place, um, you know, we can, we can trust that those virtual zones are good. Any questions there? Makes sense, right? Pretty straightforward. <clears throat> so that's the uh, detect and locate portion. We have an analytics section, and it builds out some, let that load. It builds out some um, standard reporting. I haven't really looked at these very closely, but I'll talk about total visits in a particular period of time, how many visitors you've had, um, what the trend is. Now, this one's interesting because this is simulated data and it's, it tends to be the same. We have a pretty straight graph. But if you're looking at the trend over time, you might see, um, again, for that retail, retail space discussion, you might see a spike at um, you know, the time right after work or something like that. So that's the analytics, analytics portion. And you can go through all of the different floors and see um, what, where that is. Um, I think it provides some dwell time information as well. And that's how long, basically an aggregation of how long um, device or devices have stayed in a spot. Um, so you can leverage it for that. Um, so it's just slicing and dicing of that data that's coming back through the MSC. I'm, I'm going to skip connect and engage because I, I don't know a lot about it, and I would just be embarrassing myself. And this is a technical talk and not a marketing ploy. So now we're going to hop into the kind of demo part of this. So the thing we're going to take a look at, well, let's, let's take a look at the API doc. So all this information that's being provided to this front end here is being provided through the APIs. So um, and the nice thing for about the MSC, if you deploy it, is that it comes with its API docs. And it's broken out into different sections. Um, the ones we're going to look at are the configuration and location APIs, because um, they're of particular interest to me. But you can imagine a scenario where you could leverage uh, the analytics or connect APIs as well. So the configuration one in particular that I'm interested in, uh, we're going we're gonna to get back to notifi uh, notification subscription API in a second. Um, but we're going to start looking at the map resources API. And the reason I point this one out is that, <clears throat> say you are writing an application, it could be a mobile app, a web app, the first thing that you want to do is load the map image up. You don't necessarily want to save that on the client side. It's something you want to grab from the server. And so we want to get that map information first so that we can load it up on the screen. And then from that, uh, we, we want to load it up on the screen. We want to get its dimensions, because those are the two things that we need. Well, we need the image and we need the dimensions. So that when we're figuring out where to put that blue dot or green dot, whatever you want to call it, um, on the screen, we know where to, where to put that based on the coordinates and, or based on the dimensions of the map. So the first thing we're going to do is call this REST API. So if we're looking at this, um, we can get account of all the map elements, get all maps, get campus by name. Um, let's say we want to get a floor inside a specific building. Now, I'm gonna, we saw this in Coding 101, and you'll see it a, a few times over the course of the sessions today. But um, a lot of times, 
good API documentation will allow you to interact with the um, API without having to go to any other tool to use it. So we talk about using a REST client called Postman. Um, I had shown in, one, uh, in 101 how to use the Spark API documentation, and now I'm showing you how to use the CMX API documentation. So um, in this instance, I can put that information in, and now the problem with this is I know this one's not going to work because there's an, a bug in this particular part of the docs. Um, But you can fill all that information in and hit try it. Um, I get a 401 because, oh, I'm not authorized. <laughs> Make that mistake every time. Um, this requires you to put that content in. So if you are following along, uh, the username is learning and the password is learning. Oh, we did, it. We did get a 200. Oh, that all worked out OK. That was great. So, surprise. <laughs> so I was able to get uh, 200 OK. And uh, it gives us our response headers, which pro probably don't care too much about. Uh, but what we do care about is this content at the bottom. So this is, this is live data. This is coming from our Mobility Services Engine sandbox. Um, we're seeing similar information to what we saw in the GUI. Um, we're seeing the DevNet zone. But now we're getting the actual uh, parameters. So this is, the, this is the floor dimensions that have been set up for that particular floor. Um, and I think I set it up for feet. Uh, so this is 81.9 feet um, long by uh, 307 feet wide. Um, and the height of the floor was 16 and a half feet. Um, so that data is being fed uh, or is being used by the MSC to figure out the information. Uh, uh, it's being used to figure out the location based on the information coming back from the access points. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And then again, we want to pull that map in, right? And so we have a reference to our image name. That image is saved locally on the MSC. Um, so it, it creates an ID for it, and you can pull that back. So we actually want to get the image. And I think, this is, I think it's getting the image this, is where I ran into issues with the, with the demo here. We'll try it. Maybe we'll get lucky. If not, we'll run it in Postman. Yeah, so we're getting an error on that one. But I have a backup. <laughs> so this is the same API call. I'm just running it in Postman. I think this has to do with um, the port number that I have to put in. Um, if you're not familiar with Postman, real quick, this is a REST client. Um, and it allows you to test out APIs uh, for your own use a little. It gives you a lot more control than the documentation might. The documentation is usually good for, I understand this. Oh, the data comes back this way. That's cool. Um, but if you want to do a little bit more manipulation, uh, you go to a REST client like this. Um, the thing I didn't show in 101 um, that, I, that I do want to point out about this particular REST client is if you're comfortable writing code, you can actually pop out the API call into code. So we leverage Python a lot in, um, our, in our classes. And if you're writing a script to do something in Python, um, you can pop it out in that. It actually gives you a lot of different options to be able to do that. So there's a, just a quick tangent there. But anyways, <coughs> I send this API call. I get my image back. Um, I can reference this file now and load it into the application if I want to. All right, let's go back. So that's the documentation. I also want to point out real quickly the location API. And then we'll get into notification subscriptions, because <coughs> I think that's the most useful piece to show people. So we have the location API. And this gives us information. Um, we're not tracking any tags, so those API calls won't bring us anything back. If we wanted to look at the client history, where things have been, if you're building out an analytics set, you might use the client history. Um, and, but the one that we're going to be looking at today is the Active Clients API, because this one's the easiest one to use. Um, now, let's say we just want to get a count of the API or of the clients coming back. Um, right now, it's tracking 72 clients. Um, and if I wanted to mimic this particular API call in Postman, I just grab that. And 
and that'll give us the same data. So it's hitting that same service, so we would expect that there's the same data there. The other one that we have are the list of all clients. And then this is where you get the information to be able to place that blue dot. <coughs> there we go. Um, so a quick note on this particular API, you notice that there's a little more, um, a little more documentation to it. So it allows you to um, pinpoint then if you want a location of a specific um, device, you can go by IP address, you can go by MAC address, and if you have this set up to a situation where you're running over so like an Active Directory or an LDAP environment, you might be able to then uh, go by username as well, because it'll, um, you can set it up to associate a device with a username um, if you wanted to in, a, you know, in an office environment. Um, there's also notes about pagination. Um, if you're tracking thousands of clients, you could get a very big data set. Um, so you might want to chunk that up so the API call doesn't take super long. Um, so there's some information about pagination. Um, you might want to sort by different items. Um, you know, obviously, you could do MAC address. Um, but I, I would argue that last located time is probably one of the more useful sorts that you would do. Um, but if you just want to get a dump of the client uh, the list of clients and where they're located at any given time. You just run it with unfettered, um, no unnecessary uh, query parameters, no unnecessary sorts, and we get back the list of all of the clients that are available to us here. Let's scroll down there. And this gives us a lot of information, the MAC address, where it is, in uh, which map it's found in. So we were looking at the DevNet Zone map. This one in particular is going to a, a map called Cake Bread, uh, which is a conference room in San Jose. Um, it gives us the dimensions for that, which is nice. Uh, it also gives us, actually it pulls back the image for that particular space as well. So you actually don't need to make the map call, now I'm realizing it, because it does it all for you. <laughs> Um, now, the most important information if you're providing location services, and it's the map coordinate. And so in this instance, it's coming back as 16.2 feet, or 16.2 by 22.1. Um, when you're dealing with the CMX maps, uh, everything is in the upper left corner is zero, zero. And so if we have a certain dimension of, um, feet in, or a certain dimension of length and width, you would use the x, y values divided by those particular, uh, or divide the particular dimensions by that, come up with your cross point, and that's where you would put that blue dot on the map. So that is, that map coordinate is actually the most important part of all of this data. Um, now, the confidence factor is then where you draw that circle. So um, you know if you're in, on a, like a mapping, a GPS map, there's a circle around you with a confidence of that you're particularly in that space. Um, that's what that confidence factor helps you do is to draw that, that halo circled around you to say, I think you're here, but you might be anywhere in this circle. <laughs> uh, confidence factor 40 is pretty low. Um, I don't actually know how the simulator generates that data. Um, so the circle would be very, very big for this particular, um, for this particular item. So that's the data that comes back for each client. So every client, all 72 clients that we're tracking in this space will have similar data for that. Um, and that could be useful if you're building an application to, to pinpoint location, or if you're providing some kind of analytics dashboard as well. Any questions on that? All right, cool. Now, one of the more useful APIs. So everything we did, um, every API call we made was a poll. We went out to the service and said, I want information, and it gave it back. And that was it. That was the end of the transaction. Well, the MSE is set up to provide for what's called a notification subscription, because you don't, always, you don't necessarily want to set up an application to always, to always pull. And s there we go. So there's an API for that. <laughs> um, I'm going to actually jump back in to the CMX and show you guys what it looks like to set up a notification subscription in the GUI, um, and then we'll look at what it takes to set it up in the, in the, uh, through the API. We have about 10 minutes, and I think should be fine going through that. I'm going to delete all these. These are from my workbench session from yesterday. <laughs> How many are, uh, we're not going to do that. 
So anyway, um, let's take a look at one that already exists. I think, yeah, I already have some set up here. So in these notifications, uh, we set the name. That's all fine and good. Um, then we look at the type. The type, um, there are, what, a dozen there or so of different types of notifications we can set up. Um, the one we're going to look at is in and out. That's am I in a space or out of a space? Should I send a notification for which event? Um, you might set up a notification, an absence notification, if you're working in an area where devices shouldn't be leaving. So for example, we have those um, workstations have the Macs on them. And we want, if we wanted to track them and make sure that they didn't leave this area, we might set it an abs absence notification for that. Um, uh, we might want to set up things for a location update uh, just to know if you know one thing went from one place to another or left a zone. Um, or if things aren't supposed to move very much, they can move, but they're not supposed to move a lot. I can't think of a reason for that right now off the top of my head. Um, but you might set up a movement, uh, uh, a movement notification for that. And so you'd uh, set it up for a particular floor, um, and then you'd make it for a particular distance. So things like that. Um, it would allow you to then monitor and track your devices without having to uh, pull that information over and over again. The MSC will send that notification subscription to you. Um, so we're going to look at in and out. Um, I can determine whether or not if I want it to be to tell me only when it's in or or, or when it's out. I could limit it to a particular MAC address. I can limit it to a particular uh, floor hierarchy. Um, so this one, I'm going to stick to my DevNet zone and then I'm, or DevNet zone floor, and then we're going to try to make sure we only see things in and out of zone two. Um, and then I would say the most important part is is the receiver. So we set up a notification subscription. It has to go somewhere uh, now. In this instance, I'm just going to use an HTTP service online uh, called Request Bin. But in a production environment, you're going to set up a listener service um, that's running all the time and just expecting notifications from the MSC. Um, and then what you do with that data, I'll leave up to you or your imagination. Uh, but just assume that there's something to be done. Maybe you're, maybe you're just data warehousing it. That's all you need to do. Um, but there has to be a receiver on that side. The MSC will send it out into the ether. It doesn't check to see if that, if that application's up or not. It trusts that you've set it up properly. Um, and so, um, but yeah, you want to have a listener service on, that, on the other end of that, expecting that information. So we have this one already set up. Actually, <clears throat> let me double, let me set up a request bin here. So this is the service I was talking about. This is just, you can pretend that this is my, um, my server that's listening, because it will be listening in a second. Um, it's just creating a repository for me to, to put that information in. Now, if you are following along with this example, that's grabbing the whole thing here. <clears throat> so you set it up for HTTP. It's not HTTPS, request b.in. The port's 80, because we're going over the open internet. Um, obviously, in a production environment, you'd probably want something that is a non-standard um, TCP port um, to allow for that content to come in. We, have a, we actually have a little bit of a challenge setting up these demos, because we thought, oh, why don't we build our own listener service? Um, but uh, setting, getting the ports open is a bit of a challenge. Uh, so we just end up using public services to, and then talk about what could be <laughs> um, in our instances here. So I'm going to pop in that endpoint there. And if I set that up, if I go back to my request bin, I can then inspect the content that's coming back for it. Now I'm getting information. This is coming straight from the MSC. It's pumping that information as fast as it can into um, my service. And so we have all this information we don't care about up here, but the body is, is of particular interest. So this is the, the, the JSON that comes back in the notification. So I know we saw, or you potentially saw JSON that was uh, prettified. Um, they decided not to do that here. If we copy and pasted the entire thing, we could actually see it a little better. Um, but uh, it comes back. We see it's coming back with my, my test notification. Um, it, it's, let's see. I wonder, we'll see if this one's inside or outside. 
wireless client, device ID. All right, and then this particular in instance, it sent me a notification when the device left the space, um, so outside. So that's how we set it up in the GUI. Um, now you can imagine a scenario where you would need to use um, the API if a new device comes into the space and you reg have a, like a registration to be tracked. Um, I don't know what that particular scenario might look like, but um, you would have the device, they would register, and it could, could potentially set up a notification subscription through um, your service to then track that particular device. Um, so let's say you were at a Cisco Live and you wanted to know um, you wanted people to know what was going on in a particular room they walked in. Um, so if you walked into classroom one, you walk in, hey, you're here, uh, this is classroom one, the next session is talking about CMX. You could do that with the notification subscription service. So um, you might want to use the API to do that. So let us, let us see what that looks like. Now I'm going to jump to the documentation real quick, point something out, because I, you know, this is yes, this is about CMX, um, but I I think as you if you're in a situation where you start using APIs, the documentation from product to product, not just in Cisco, just in the world in general, is going to be different. There will be expectations that are not met by the documentation. And so this particular API is a really good example of, I didn't expect it to work that way, and it took me a long time to figure it out <laughs> because I was making some assumptions that uh, weren't true. So I mentioned in 101, and this gets talked about a lot, and you actually see it in some of the other APIs. When you're creating a record in a service, you usually use post. And I made this mistake in my demo yesterday when I was doing this. But you'll notice that if I want to add a notice, uh, notification subscription, it's asking for a put. That's a little confusing. And I remember going through this initial process and going, why isn't this working? It should be, it should be a post. And um, I, was, I just was glossing over the fact that the method was a put. Once I fixed it, everything was OK. But puts usually used for updating a request or updating a record, not creating one. So I just wanted to point that out. The other kind of shortcoming of this particular documentation is it asks for a set of rules and a set of subscribers. But you know that it's, you see that it's a text area. Now, with these APIs, we know we're going to send some JSON, so that's all fine and good. But I have no idea what, how, that, um, how that content should be formatted. So. I would say it's a little bit of a shortcoming of the documentation, but there are ways around it. So um, we know we can create a um, notification subscription through the GUI. So well, why can't we just set one up as a test and see what the format looks like? So that's what we did, and then reverse engineered it. And if I wanted to get the notifications, I would send this API call, API config v1 notifications, and it'll bring me back all the notifications that are set up. And what I can do then is, uh, is copy and paste one of these, and so that I don't have to worry about that my JSON is going to be um, malformatted for the API. Because if it's not in the right format, if, it's not, if it doesn't have the parameters it's expecting, like if we don't have this location update dot hierarchy for the particular condition, it's going to come back and say, you don't have valid information to, to create this notification subscription. So I want to make sure that this stuff is right. So copy and paste. And I've kind of glossed over the steps so that we didn't, you didn't have to see me type. Um, but I paste them into the body here. And we'll just change that to Matt Test Postman 2. And we're, we're going to send it to the same request bin. Let's hopefully, that's the last thing I did. Yes. Uh, we're going to send it to the same request bin. And, and, and we see all the information in there. So now I know that my conditions are right. Under the rules section, I know how to set up the sub subscribers. Um, so that's the receiver that we're going to actually send the content to, how we set that up in the GUI. Um, and I believe if everything worked properly, 
We get a 201 created, no other information coming back from the MSC except for the status code here, so we're good. Um, and if we go into the GUI, we can double check that it was actually created properly just for our fun. So it was Matt Test Postman 2, right? So we see that there. That's great. Um, everything looks good. So now if we go to our receiver, we should see notifications coming from both um, my test notification and my test postman too. Uh, we'll just keep reloading until we see any new ones. There, there we go. Now we got one from that test postman too. So this receiver now is receiving two notifications. They're essentially the same, but there might be a scenario where it's, um, you know, if you're tracking individual devices one by one, you'd be getting notifications for all of them. So for each subscription. So um, that is it. Uh, are there any questions before I get into the, like the closing portion of this? Any questions of what I've done? T uh, it's over TCP. Yeah. Um, so thank you guys. Um, you know, I don't know how much time you spent in the DevNet zone yet. Uh, we have sessions all day long in the theater, in the classrooms, all of that fun stuff. We have workbench sessions. Um, so if you want to kind of actually code along, we can do, we have those set up as well. Uh, we have our learning labs. All of this content is, is covered in a learning lab. So if you want to review that, you can do that as well. Uh, we also have the DevNet zone challenge, um, which is you get credit for attending this session. Uh, what you have to do is install Spark. And um, there are some instructions. They're actually on this, this card here, if you don't mind me showing you. So on this card here, it'll tell you what you need to do to get started. Um, and then you get credit for that. It doesn't take a lot to actually earn um, enough points to get you know, a hat and socks. And we have blankets. So we have a lot of cool stuff at the info desk. And just requires you put in a little effort today. You actually already earned a, a thing by coming to this event or to this session, it only takes one activity to, uh, to earn your hat or socks. So, um, you know, feel free, to, feel free to head over to the info booth and do that. So um, that's all I have to say about uh, for, so for the closing. So thank you guys. I appreciate the time you gave me. Um, if you have any uh, questions afterwards, we can definitely discuss them after that. So thank you.